So I want you to, you know, the teachers that are in the, currently in the room right now, I want you to let me know, how, what would you prefer? Taking our time or just doing questions, just focusing on questions. And, and, and realistically, you know, we have an hour. So give me some feedback right now. What would you prefer to do? Okay, so, so I'm getting questions. So I'm not going to teach uh, history so much as we're going to analyze history questions. Uh, and we're going to look at, hopefully, we'll look at this range here, questions coming after, after, you know, the Civil War. We actually did a couple after the Civil War, but this is post-Reconstruction, you know, through the first half of the ninth, uh, 20th century. And then we'll look at questions that would fall after World War II after World War II, probably to the 1980s. And then we'll just answer some map questions. So everything today will just be applied history questions evolving around the 20th century. Thumbs up, is this fair? I think that's that's something. <clears throat> okay, I think we can do that then. Then that's how I'll approach today, okay? Um, First set of questions is going to be on the Gilded Age. And this is this has to do with this period after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, where we're going to see a lot of new technologies come out. A lot, and these technologies are going to lead to major corporations. And we're also going to see uh, the rise of monopolies. And we're also going to see the rise of labor. So we're going to see these a whole bunch of things developing in the U.S. economy. And the economy grows very rapidly. So let's look, and, and, and first thing we're going to look at in this Gilded Age is we're going to look at how, uh, um, how technology and the economy was transformed with the railroads. Take a moment, please, and, and read over this question, thinking about this period of time and how the railroads, the transatlantic railroad that was finished in 1869, how that transformed things in the economy. Take a few moments and read this one over, thinking about this period of time and the transatlantic, transcontinental railroad. Take a moment. It says here, <coughs> the last half. So let's think about the last half as sorta of after the Civil War, okay? Let's think of after the Civil War, the last half of the 19th century is after the Civil War. And it's talking about farming and farming chain. It moves from being um, uh, small family farms, small family farms to commercialized, large commercialized farms. And it's talking about, you know, what led to this? What led to this? Um, give me a thumbs up if you have an answer. Was it having to do with these elements here? No, these are actually all... No, it's, it's this one right here, right? And let's highlight this phrase, technological innovations. And let's write down that phrase is referring to the railroad. And the railroad that's connecting East Coast, West Coast, up, down. This is a new technological innovation. You can cross the country. Now what would have taken a few months, now it's going to be uh, decreased in a much shorter time. So now... Large farms and large commercial farms are able to move their products all around the United States much, much faster. And those commercial farms are going to have much more influence in moving products than the local farmer. Thumbs up. And this is what we're referring to. And at this time, this was a major, this was a big deal. Okay, let's look at another, another question, okay? This one's involving division of labor. When you think about division of labor, this means within every industry, every industry there is, uh, we've talked about specialized labor before, but now when we think about division, division of labor, every industry is going to have, you know, be broken up into different tasks for, so that each task can be specialized in. Take a moment and read this one over. What is the industry here? What is, what are we looking at here? We're taking, uh, we're looking at law enforcement. Is that right? And in that one area, there's several divisions of labor. We have patrol, detective, domestic, yes, traffic. Now, this is taking this one industry and it's giving an example of what? What's the answer? Division of labor. Who finds this one not that bad, right? 
who's like, yeah, I got this. I mean, if I know what divisional labor is, I can definitely spot that this is an example of divisional labor, right? Yes. I think this is the thing. <clears throat> Some of these questions are going to be fairly easy, right? They're going to be they're going to be relatively easy as long as you already have in your mind what this idea is: division of labor, and you you can recognize it when it comes in a question. Who agrees? So you're going through these, you're making sure you understand each one of these phrases, you know, because if you saw this on the test, you'd want to be able to recognize it on the test. They give you a scenario, you got to match up. Look at this right here. They describe, they're describing the concept. They're describing it. You, 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 they're giving you, they're describing the concept and you got to match up the concept. So you have to recognize the concept. All right. This is probably the easiest type of question you're going to have where they give you the description of the concept. They literally describe the definition or give an example of the concept. And if you know it, or, if you know it, it's easy. If you don't, it's hard. Thumbs up. Okay. Um, let's jump to another one right here. And this one, I'm going to jump a little bit because we want to fit in as many as we can and I can't do every one. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, these are startup companies uh, 10 years ago. This is from 10 years ago. Now, now, does anyone see a company, a startup that has lasted and has really gained popularity? Any, any startup company that has gained popularity? This is from 10 years ago. But what has, what has a startup? Duolingo, is Duolingo big now? Who's heard of this one right here? And I know it's getting hit hard right now, but who's heard of Uber, right? Who's used Uber before? Okay, so any one of these are examples of entre entrepreneurship, but but startups are an example of entrepreneurship. And these are these are companies and that are um, providing a service or a way of doing things or or a product. They're and they're finding a new and profitable way to to offer these things. So Uber is doing a service. They found a new and profitable way to offer that service. Give me a thumbs up. Yes. So when we think of an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, we're looking at companies that find new and profitable ways to provide a service or product, thumbs up, to make money. Take a moment, read the question. Again, this isn't a short question. It's got a, a tier three concept, right? And they're looking for you to define it. So if you know what this tier three idea is, then the definition all you're asked to do is define that concept. Give me a thumbs up if you have an answer. Give me a thumbs up. Give me A, B, C. What do you got? <clears throat> What's the definition of entrepreneurship? Companies like Uber, they're finding, they, they're finding a profitable way to, uh, to organize land, labor, or capital. So which one is Uber doing? They're finding a profitable way to do what? To reinvent what? They're providing what? A service or labor, right? So one example could be Uber, and Uber is finding a profitable way to reorganize labor using technology. Thumbs up? Give me thumbs up, yes? So this is literally another question where if you know the tier three word, you know the definition of that word, Okay, you'll be able to get to the answer a little bit faster. Okay, uh, how about um, let's jump. We have to jump. So in jumping, we're going to really connect, connect, you know, the progressive error, which is this time frame here. And this is that time when the U.S. government was getting involved and passing laws to protect the consumer. These laws were like the Meat Inspection Act or the Food and Drug Act. These are laws that are passed um, because at that time, there were no regulations in factories to make sure that meat was sanitary, okay? Or drugs that, we, that you take, medicines that you take were safe. So they're passing these laws. The federal government is very hands-on. I'm going to put hands here. 
They're very hands-on getting involved, passing laws to protect the consumer, okay? Increased regulation. We have a period of increased regulation. Uh, and then we go into World War I. And let's jump, or we're jumping. I'm so sorry, but we have to jump. But let's just mark a couple things, World War I. First of all, let's look at the dates of World War I, 1914 uh, to uh, 1917. There's a lot of different things we could talk about that lead to World War I. But the one that we're going to focus on, if you're writing an essay, a history teacher on factors that led to World War I, You'd want to talk about nationalism. You'd want to talk about an arms race. You know, you'd want to talk about these things. But the one that we're going to look on is this assassination of this archduke in Austria. Give me a thumbs up. And this sort of <clears throat> this sort of was the the thing that broke the camel's back in terms of launching the world into World War One. Give me a thumbs up. Yes. So we got the war started with this assassination of the arch of an archduke in Austria, and this sort, along with several other things, ignited World War One. We have different groups. We have central powers. We have allied powers. Okay. Again, I'm going to jump around. The United States did the United States uh, get involved? Did, did we jump into this? Did we get involved immediately? No, we waited. The war starts in 1914, 1915, <laughs> 1916. When you write it like this, it's it really means that we waited a long time because we didn't get involved until 1917, right? So we waited three years for this war to occur. And this was a very costly and violent war, you know, trench warfare. Okay, we do get involved in 1917 and let's highlight something here it's that u.s involvement that sort of turned the tide give me a thumbs up so how did the war end <clears throat> u.s involvement turned the tide and now that we think about it what also might have oops what what also might have ended the war uh what also might have what also might have ended that war or helped influence the end of the war Give me a thumbs up. Who's got something? Spanish flu uh, in the spring before the war ends. is It's going to impact over a third of the population. Uh, eventually, it's going to kill over 50 million people by that fall. Right? <clears throat> Interesting. These two events are overlapping, right? We're still fighting the war in the spring of 1918. We, 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 the war is over in the fall of 1918, but these, but still this, this is killing off, um, a lot of 50 million people. So, okay. So it's interesting how this event, I was, I was talking to John who does the Go Academy show with me. You know, we never really targeted the Spanish flu before. We always are so focused on world war one. And, and the Spanish flu was like, yeah, you know, got to keep going. But when you think about it, 50 million people, a third, a third of the popu po world population being infected by that pandemic, you know, 50 mil 500 million people being infected and 50 million people dying. Okay, wow. And you think about that impact. I mean, the question is, why haven't we been talking about it in the classes? You know what I mean? It's funny how you focus on third certain things and forget others. Okay, so real quick, type something in real quick. How did the war start? What was an event that happened that, that led to World War I? Type something in real quick. Type, 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 type. An assassination of an archduke in Austria. How did the war end? How did the war end? U.S. involvement with troops and resources. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's jump and not talk about the 1920s, right? Or the roaring 20s where we're trying to get back to normal. Lots and lots of things are happening during um, the 1920s. There's a lot of consumerism. Uh, that means people are buying things. There's urbanization. That means the cities are growing larger and larger. There's a, uh, there is a renaissance in art and culture going on in, in Harlem and throughout the United States. We have a, a renaissance in music 
and dance, also or in writing, all this this incredible creative period. We also have during this time a rise of intolerance, and the Ku Klux Klan goes to rises from something that had been suppressed during Reconstruction to close to three million followers. So lots of things going on during this time, some good things and some very bad things. Um, <clears throat> but let's write down here: the U.S. government was very hands off. That's my image for hands off, right? They weren't regulating the economy. Not regulating the economy, and that leads to uh, on October 29th. On that Monday in October 29th, the economy is not being regulated and it crashes. Is that right? Give me a thumbs up. This is the Great Depression. Yes. Who's seen this picture before? And 10 years ago, I was talking about the, the Great Depression, the, the Second Great Depression, right? When was the Second Great Depression? The Second Great Depression in terms of U.S., when we talk about it, you know, that's from, that's from 2000 and, uh, um, 2008 to 2010, right? People losing their homes. Who remembers those days? Yes? Kind of? Sort of? Maybe, come on, give me a yes or no there. There's a pretty big group here. You forgot? Oh, yeah? <laughs> Team, do you know what we are faced with right now is going to make this, I mean, what we're, what we're, what we're faced with right now is much closer to this. Not to say that this wasn't bad, but, but it's kind of scary what's going on right now. It's, when you think about it, it's it's a little bit, it's much more severe than this one right here. If you thought that one 10 years ago was bad, I mean, what's going on right now with the U.S. economy is, is I think, far worse. Um, but we got to stay positive and keep it. Yes, yes, you're hearing what I'm saying, though, on that? And we're going to see, and we are seeing right now, uh, the type of spending that, that was going on during this time. So, so it's kind of relevant. It's more relevant. You're going to see here, let me go back. Let me do this one right here. Lots of government spending going on during this time to get us out of this hole. And, uh, and this is going to involve things involving the, the New Deal. Let me write down New Deal. So our New Deal... We're looking at the New Deal, and I'll write down 1933 to get us out of this incredible hole. The federal government is passing um, um, all these federal programs and, and spending all this money, just like we're doing right now, okay? But it's probably going to have to continue because this was over several years, and this was over a decade to get at, dig out of that hole, over a decade. We're probably more in that, a similar situation, but the federal government is passing all these programs to help consume, to help people get back their jobs. Now, there's lots of different federal programs. There's this one and this one and this one and this one that are designed to help people um, secure their jobs and their livelihood. But I want to focus on within the New Deal during this time. First, let's make the honorable mention. The government is very, please write down, hands on again. They were hands-on during the Progressive Era, then World War I happened, and the Roaring Twenties, hands-off, and now the government is New Deal in the 1930s is very hands-on. And now they're passing, they're passing programs designed to protect jobs. Okay, give me a thumbs up. And to protect livelihoods during the New Deal. Thumbs up. And one of those is the WPA. Who's heard of the WPA? The workers program. Who's heard of this progress program? Who's heard of that? You should. This is a tier three idea. What was the purpose of this program? What was this was a federally funded program and it was designed to do what? What was its function? Come on, help me out. Someone type something in. What was the this this phrase, this acronym here? Uh, jargon here, WPA, what was it known for? It was known for jobs. It gave millions of people jobs in the 1930s that had lost their jobs. 
building schools, building libraries, building bridges, building tunnels, building the infrastructure throughout the United States that we, we use today. You know, the United States right now is probably going to head into something where they're going to need something more like this than ever before. We just had, we're going to have, we, we're in the range of how many people have lost their jobs? 30 million people have lost their jobs. Team, do you know how crazy that is? 30 million people. The U.S. economy, even at its best, if it was chugging out 50, um, if it was chugging out 500,000 new jobs a month, right? At its best. Unbelievable. That would take 10 years to, to, um, to get back there. I mean, we're, we're talking about eight, 10. We're talking a long time if things don't change soon. Okay. You're going to remember here that this was the program that put millions of people back to work. Give me a thumbs up. Yes? Yes? Okay, let's answer some questions real quick. Okay, take a moment. Read the question. We have the progressive era, which was very hands-on. The, the government was passing laws to regulate what was going on in factories to protect the consumer and the New Deal, which was very hands-on. <clears throat> but let's see here. Um, were, was the idea with these two tier three ideas that the welfare society would be put in the free market, uh, cap, the free market economy and capitalism? Was that the idea that we'll just let the the market take care of everything? Yes or no? No, no, right. Now, it was that the problems of society could be solved through government initiatives, right? So what were the problems during the progressive era? What were the, what were the pro problems during um, the progressive era? <clears throat> they had to do with um, the consumer, right? The consumer not being safe, the products not being safe, the factories not being safe, yes? And what were the problems during the New Deal? Jobs having to do with getting people back to work. So here the government's passing laws to protect the consumer, protect the factory worker, right? Here the government's passing laws to get people back to work. Give me a thumbs up. Yeah? Okay. Um, again, we're not talking, we're not, we don't have time to do this. But if we were talking about um, how we go from the end of World War I, uh, 1919, to the beginning of World War II, uh, 1941, right? So we just end the World War, and this is the end of World War I, and, and coming out of World War I, and we start another World War, World War II. I mean, how does that happen within a generation, right? How does that happen within just 20 years, one generation? We end the war. war to, this was World War I was to end all wars. And how do we end it? And then in one generation, we're back in it. Well, there's a lot of different things that go to that. There's a lot of different factors that lead to World War II. Okay. First of all, we should think about this time frame here in the United States, this time frame here. Half this time is being spent, you know, um, the United States is in isolation and we're just, we're just in the ro roaring 20s, okay? So we're just getting our economy back and the economy is growing. And then the other half of the time is the economy dealing with the Great Depression, okay? And so there are things going on around the world, but the U.S. is not heavily focused on what's going on in the rest of the world. They're more focused on what's going on in the United States. But there are other things going on in the world right now. Um, let's highlight the Versailles Treaty. If you had to talk about one factor that led to the rise of fascism in the 1920s and 30s in, the, in, 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 great, in, uh, in Europe, you could talk about the impact of the Versailles Treaty <clears throat> and how that the Versailles Treaty um, created a lot of anger over those that were on the losing side. Because they were Germany, for example, was, was responsible for paying billions of dollars in war debt, and they lost their colonies around the world, and they went into an economic recession and depression. 
and that led to massive inflation. So, so there's actually two things. Um, one, the Versailles Treaty, um, not only did it punish countries like Germany, um, people lost their faith in the political leadership at that time. They thought they were incredibly disillusioned by the, 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 the leadership. At the same time, a second factor uh, happened was a economic depression, recession and depression and massive inflation. And these two things led um, countries like Germany to be more open um, to radical groups like the Nazi party. <clears throat> and this wasn't just in Germany, it was also happening in Italy. It was also happening in Japan. So the rise of, 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 of fascism and we, countries that were building off of this, you know, disillusionment and frustration and anger grew. We're not gonna be able to do this today, okay? It's not the focus of today. But what we can say, we should talk about a couple things here real quick. What is this phrase appeasement? What's that tier three phrase? Type something in real quick. What's appeasement? This was that European policy that was a nonviolent approach to stopping fascism. This is something that both Britain and France used to try and stop the rise of, to stop, you know, um, Germany at this time, to prevent a war. So it was a nonviolent approach to, uh, to try and slow down Germany's growth and the rise of fascism in Europe at that time. Did it work? Did it work? Yes or no? No, it did not work at all. In fact, what it what it did was it ended up in it ended up emboldening Germany continue to to be more and more aggressive in its expansion. Okay. Um, all right. Again, I'm going through this. Uh, we're not doing the Holocaust, but. Was the United States aware of what was going on in Germany during this time? You know, with these concentration camps, were we aware? I mean, this is 1930s. That's the start of the New Deal. Okay, and the U.S. wasn't going to get involved till uh, 1941. But but we, were we aware of what was going on during this time? Yeah, we team. There were a lot of things going on that we were aware of. The full extent of the concentration camps? No, I mean, I mean that stuff there. That was that was you know that came out at, at the tail end of the war. Okay, but but we were very aware of what was going on day to day. I mean, this was 1933. This stuff was in the newspapers. It just wasn't the focus at that time. The focus was in the 1930s. It was jobs in the United States. Okay, all right. Um, but we're not, we don't have time to cover all these areas. Um, we should say this though. Let's talk about the this the time frame here. Um, um how, the war, the United States gets in the war in 1941 because Japan bombs Pearl Harbor. Give me a thumbs up. Or we could say a foreign power bombs a US island off the western coast of the United States. Is that right? A foreign power, Japan, bombs a island or U.S. city off the west coast of the United States. That would be um, that would be Hawaii, yes? In Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And how does it end? Well, in terms of one of the major reasons why it ends is the atomic bomb. But that doesn't end the war. Uh, that, that's, that's sort of the finishing one. Um, okay. All right. So we are butchering this history here. We are butchering this history, but, but there's some things you should walk away with. Okay. In terms of the rise of fascism in Europe during this time here, you should remember, you could, you could make a great essay on talking about economic factors and disillusionment in the, uh, in the current government because of the Versailles Treaty, frustration in the weak government and frustration in leadership. You know, you could make a case for these two things, you know, um, disillusionment in the in the current leadership and that weak government and also um, um, economic problems going on in Europe in the 1920s. 
these two things sort of created that environment for uh, right-wing groups like fascism to grow. Give me a thumbs up. So there's economic and political factors that led to the rise of fascism in the 1920s and 30s in Europe. Here are those two ideas again, economic factors and political factors evolving around the Versailles Treaty and people being frustrated with their current political leaders agreeing to, dissatisfied with the, their current leaders for agreeing to some of the, some of the reparations that were applied to, that they had to agree to under the Versailles Treaty. So Economic factors and political factors are two things that sort of led to the rise of fascism in the 1920s and 30s. Thumbs up. And also, you're going to remember here in terms of, you know, rise of fascism, not just two factors like political and economic factors that led to the rise of fascism in the 1920s and 30s, but you're also going to remember appeasement. That was that failed nonviolent political po policy that Great Britain and France did, right? You're going to research what appeasement was. They basically underestimated how powerful uh, and how um, aggressive uh, Germany was. Okay. All right. Um, not bad. We did. We did. Uh, we did uh, from 1877 to uh, 1945 in 30 minutes. Woo! How are we doing? Is this okay? We might just make it. We might just make it. Let's talk about after World War I and into the 90s. Now, in this time frame here, the U.S. government was uh, going to be dealing with uh, the Cold War. And the Cold War is referencing thus communism and concerns over communism and the spread of communism. Uh, and there are, it's not just the Soviet Union, we're also talking about China within a few years after World War I turns communism. So now we have almost a third of the population co that's communism. And so now the, when we talk about the Cold War and this time frame here, Let's just all write down the U.S. policy during the t this time frame. I should really write down from this time frame here to 1990s was really to stop the spread of communism. Thumbs up. And we're going to see this in all the proxy wars that occur during this time. We'll see this in the in the Korean War. Um, we're also going to see this um, not just in the, the Korean War. We're going to see this in the Vietnam War, too. In both the Korean War, the Vietnam War, uh, let's highlight the Red Scare during this time here too. It was all about stopping communism or the fear of communism in the United States. Give me a thumbs up. So the United States gets involved in the, uh, in the Korean War. And so there's North Korea, South Korea. Who is funding? This is a proxy war, so we're not directly involved. Who's supporting South Korea? Who's supporting South Korea? The United States, right? Who's funding and supporting North Korea? Who's funding and supporting the North? China and the Communist Party. So it's a proxy war uh, involving um, concerns over the spread of communism. <clears throat> Let's go to the Vietnam War. There's North Vietnam, South Vietnam. Who is funding South Vietnam? The United States. Who is funding North Vietnam? Um, China. Okay. And there's this idea out there called the domino theory. What was the domino theory in terms of the cold? What was that connected to the Cold War? What was that? That was this idea in terms of what was it saying about communism? That people should play dominoes? That communist countries like to, what is it? It had to do with the spread of communism, saying that, you know what, if we don't stop communi communism, has already spread in China, it's spreading in Vietnam, and if we don't stop it, it's soon going to impact Western countries like India and the United States, right? So it was used as the justification to get involved in all these long protracted wars, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Afghan War. So it was that 
U.S. policy justification for why we're in that war. Thumbs up. Yes, all these wars going on during wars that were legal and illegal at undeclared and declared at that time to stop the spread of communism. Thumbs up. Okay. Um, I just have to do questions. All right. Um, some questions have been cut. Um, let me see which ones I can add in. Okay. I, I, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump. Okay. Um, because we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm going to do civil rights movement. I'm going to do Kennedy. I'm going to do Reagan. Just a couple more questions and we'll get to maps. Okay. Uh, first, during this time where we have this, we're fighting the spread of communism and fighting all these wars, we also have a huge jump here, the civil rights movement, right? Yes? Give me a thumbs up. Now, this is May 18th, 1954, and the headline here is uh, referencing what? Segregation's unconstitutional. It's referencing Brown versus the Board of Education. So Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954. It's, it's not the start of the civil rights movement, but it's definitely the first major new piece of legislation that moves us back into protecting civil liberties, civil personal rights, the, right, um, to a, um, the rights of the individual, and everyone getting a, a fair and equal, everyone being treated equally with the federal government. So, so under Reconstruction, remember under Reconstruction, we had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Well, Brown versus the Board of Education, you know, we after Reconstruction, we take two steps back. And the 14th and 15th Amendment, those, those the progress that was made there in civil civil rights and voter rights was mainly nullified. And now we're making um, some steps forward. Thumbs up. Many, many events going on in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. All these major events going on. And these are only a few. But when we think about all of these events, they're leading up to these two right here. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voter Rights Act of 1965. And I'm going to write down here 14th Amendment and 15th Amendment. All right, so the Civil Rights Act says what? It forbids what? It forbids discrimination. It forbids discrimination in public restaurants and public facilities and restaurants. It says that the federal government and these public facilities can't discriminate against someone. Is that right? And this, this law, it goes back and it, it reestablishes and, re and adds some teeth back into the 14th Amendment. It gives it, it protects you know from discrimination that was going on that was nullifying things that were going on in the Fourteenth Amendment, and the Voter Rights Act of 1965 um, prevents makes it illegal to discriminate in the voting booth, right? So this is again adding teeth, protecting things that were going on in the voting booth at that time. Okay, um, preventing nullifying progress that was made through uh, the right to vote. Thumbs up. Okay, so we could think about the, you could have questions on like, what was the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Why was it important? You'd want to be able to talk about uh, what it was, why it was important, or the Voters' Rights Act. Um, why, what, what was the Voters' Rights Act? Why was that important? And in any conversation on these two things, I'm hoping you would reference things going on in the 14th and 15th Amendment. Okay. All right, so which one of these had to do with um, making it a, uh, forbidding discrimination by the federal government or uh, discrimination in public, space, uh, public spaces? The Voters' Rights Act of 1964. The Voters' Right, the Civil Rights, I'm sorry, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prevented uh, discrimination. Which one of these has to do with preventing discrimination in the voting booth? The Voters' Rights Act of 1965. I'm sorry, I messed up. But but you get the idea, right? I'm going to put a tier three here and, and mark these as very important terms that you should know and you should take a closer look at, okay? Um, let's, um, 
let's see if we can make this connection here. Um, in the 14th Amendment, there is something called the Equal Protection Clause. Who's heard of that? And it says here that the state or federal government can't deprive someone of their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They can't come up with a law. The federal government can't come up with a law that's going to take these things away unless there's um, due process. And everyone has to have equal protection under the law. So that's saying you can't discriminate against someone. Every, this, the federal government can't take away these rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, unless they have, unless they go through due process, right? Through a fair legal system. So they, you can't take away these things unless it's a fair trial and everyone needs to be protected equally under the law. Yes? Give me a thumbs up. And we said that a lot of these things were nullified after Reconstruction, but the, the Civil Rights Act in 1964 adds teeth to reinforce this. Okay. Okay, let's um, uh, let's answer this question here. Okay, take a moment. Read this one over. Take a moment. Now we got events here, here, and here. Where was the discrimination taking place? Here it was taking place where in the what jobs. And where was the discrimination taking place here? In the schools. And where was it taking place here? In voting, is that right? Give me a thumbs up. <clears throat> and in all these ones right here, in, uh, we're gonna talk about how, especially in the US Constitution and the 14th Amendment and all these other areas, the 14th Amendment and the and what was used to to come up, what was used is equal protection laws under the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment was used to make sure that there wasn't discrimination in the wor workplace. The 14th Amendment equal protection laws were used in Brown versus Board of Education, saying that everyone in public schools needs and deserves an equal access to education. The 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause was used in the Voter Rights Act, meaning that you can't discriminate in voting. Give me a thumbs up. <clears throat> so we're actually going to see this on the 14th Amendment, this, this thing that was in the 14th Amendment, we're going to see being used over and over again to protect people's uh, personal liberties as well as their right to vote. Thumbs up. Okay. And, and this doesn't just stop at the civil rights movement, right? Then equal protection under the law gets carried over. How does equal protection under the law and how does this also impact, um, where does this, uh, let's even go even more current. How do these laws here under, with, uh, with things from the 14th Amendment and 15th Amendment, but how, how does the civil rights movement um, how does this also, uh, in what other groups does it influence? So you can't discriminate in, um, in public facilities based on race, but now you can't, uh, and you can't discriminate now on what? What else? We got the women's suffrage movement in the, in the 1970s, right? You can't discriminate based on gender. Or how about uh, special education? Idea, right? Idea. You can't discriminate against individuals' intellectual ability. Thumbs up. We have the disability acts going on in the 1970s, 1980s, and 90s, right? Based on the same idea that every, okay, so, so it's impacting all groups. So if you ever had to talk about lasting impact of the civil rights movement, you could talk about how it impacted things like the women's movement in the 1970 or special education or many other groups over the last 20 years, 30 years involving, you know, protecting individuals, uh, civil rights and civil liberties. Give me a thumbs up. OK, real quick, let's answer this question on the women's suffrage movement. And it's um, it's take a moment and read it to yourself.
there's so much history that we're not doing here, but but we are making a comparison between um, two groups here. We have the 19th century movement. So I'll write down here, uh, 1850, Seneca Falls, right? And we have the 20th century, and that's going to be, let's think about that as the 1970s. And we also should be thinking about eventually, in about 20 years from now, we'll have questions on what? We'll have questions on what? What would be the next group? We have stuff going on here with the women's suffrage movement. We have stuff going on here. And in 20 years, we'll have stuff on what? Come on, write something down. What would be the next wave of, you know, in terms of, when we think of jumps and major jumps in terms of, yeah, but 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 what could we talk about here? What freight we could what could, what movement could we talk about in terms of the Me Too movement, right? I don't think you'll have a question on Me Too movement for another twenty years, but you, then you'll find something uh, in twenty years from now, and and that will be uh, you'll on the next in twenty years the teacher exams will have something on Me Too, maybe or thirty years they'll have something on Me Too. I'm sure of it. And it'll be how the uh, the Me Too movement in the nineteen uh, in in uh, the two thousand and twenty was different than the nineteen seventies, right? <clears throat> okay, right now though we're we're not there yet. This exam is doing history that's over thirty years old. So let's just stick with the stuff that it's got. Uh, both, uh, so eighteen twenties was focusing on um, wanted citizenship rights, right? Um, and building up education. So this is more referring, referencing, this is more referencing this one right here. Yes? The 1970s, what's the answer to this one? Was challenging more what? The focus was shifted a little bit to what? Over motherhood and professional careers, right? Give me a thumbs up. Now questions like this are in are in, and this whole test is in is in need of a major massive revamp a mega overhaul. So I think that in the next couple of years the next this test when it's rewritten you won't have questions like this. You'll have questions that they put a lot more thought into expanding them out a little bit. But right now you're dealing with questions like this that, that boil down these two movements into just a sentence, right? And so it's very, very, very generic. Who sees how generic this question is, right? Who sees that? Yeah, right? I mean, this is this may be one question you have on the women's suffrage movement from the 19, 1850s and 1970s. So I think in future exams, they will, they will do, uh, hopefully they will get into these questions in much more detail and they'll be harder. But right now, I don't think you have that. So you just need to know this general stuff. Um, I want to jump. And I want to jump to, uh, oops, I got something that's all scrambled. Is that all scrambled? It is. So what I'm going to do is only work on the second question here. And But let me just do a little preview. 1980s Reagan administration, okay? What's foreign policy? Foreign policy at that time, foreign policy is to do what? Stop what? Stop what? <clears throat> to stop communism, but then communism collapsed, and that when it collapses, then it's all about stopping, um, monitoring um, the nukes and monitoring the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? So foreign policy is to stop communism and we're fighting all sorts of things like the Afghan war, trying to stop and, and funding the Afghan war, all sorts of um, proxy battles. Um, but at the end of it, at the end of it, we're also trying to monitor um, the collapse of, of the Soviet Union and monitor the nukes, nuclear weapons. OK, we're going to do domestic policy. So we're going to do Reagan domestic policy. Give me a thumbs up. And it's all going to be about reducing. So I'm going to write down here, reduce. We're going to reduce a lot of things. In domestic policy, we're going to reduce 
Um, let's start with the first one. Reduce spending. We're going to reduce federal spending on government programs and reduce taxes. And we're going to reduce regulation or red tape. So give me those R's again. Reduce spending. Spending for after-school programs and reduce taxes for the rich. Okay? And reduce regulations to making it easy for... We're going to reduce things, right? Give me a thumbs up on reduce. Yes? Yes? Good. Read the question. Go. <clears throat> Read the question. Oh, wait. I already answered this one, right? Oh, shucks. The questions got swapped. Uh, okay, let me see if I can salvage it from here. No, I can't. Can't. It's it's all mixed in. Ah. Okay, there's a question here on Reagan and on reducing, right? And you're going to remember with a Reagan, what were the three things that Reagan's administration domestically was doing? Reducing what? What were the things they were reducing? Reducing spending. So you wouldn't have something on increasing spending, right? It wouldn't be increasing spending. It'd be decreasing spending. And you wouldn't be increasing wages, right? You would Under Reagan, we weren't increasing wages. We were decreasing wages. Is that right? And we weren't increasing taxes. We were decreasing taxes. And we were decreasing regulations or making it easier for companies to go overseas. Give me a thumbs up. Okay, so Reagan, this got, this is, so for this stuff right here, you just have to study this paragraph on Reagan's domestic and foreign policy. Okay. We got eight minutes. Uh, let's see what we can do with this. Uh, just a couple of questions here, all right? I think we're actually covering a lot within such a short period of time. First, uh, latitude. Latitude is things like the equator. Is that right? Or things like, what's the northern line of latitude? What's that called? The northern line of latitude is called what? The what? The northern line of latitude is the Tropic of Cancer. And the southern line of latitude is the Tropic of Capricorn. Is that right? Yes or no, team? And surprising. You say yes now, but how many of you will remember that? How many of you will internalize that? You know, so that when you ask, what is the northern line of latitude on your test? You'll remember that it's a tropic of cancer. I mean, these are all tier three words. How about longitude? Longitude, now we're dealing with lines like the prime meridian, right? Okay, now when we do things in terms of location and we use longitude and latitude, we always write it down as what comes first. When we're doing location, uh, location is always written as what first? Latitude first followed by longitude. Is that right? Latitude followed by longitude? Yes? Okay, read the question. Read the question. Highlight the word location and logos. Give me a thumbs up. And what always comes first? It's always what first? It's always latitude followed by what? Longitude. Give me a thumbs up. Yes. So which one is automatically wrong? Which one is automatically wrong here? That one's wrong because it starts with longitude. Agreed? Yes. Okay, now let's start with latitude. Let me do uh, with latitude. What is the, I'll write this down in a different color here, latitude here. What is the central line of latitude called? What's that called again? That's the what? That's the equator, right? The equator is the central line of latitude, yes? And logos is north or south of the equator. Logos is no north or south. So we know whatever this is, it's latitude's going to be north. Is that right? Give me a thumbs up. 
So we know it's going to be latitude followed by longitude, and we know that Lagos, whatever it is, is going to be latitude north. What's the answer? Who sees how we got that, right? We don't need to necessarily know that it's seven degrees. You just need to know that it's it's latitude is going to be north something. Give me a thumbs up. Yes. Can you remember this? Can you remember this? I hope so. Okay. Um, let's talk about geography. And I'm going to do this real quick. When we talk about geography and we talk about biomes and ecosystems, when we think of geography, a geographer looks at large regions around the world so large so it looks at how land large regions of, around the world have similar environments or climates right that connect to living things uh, uh land and life living living things right ecosystems and so we look at geographers they're looking at large chunks of land that have biomes with, with, with land that has areas with overlapping climates, which have very specific types of, of producers, consumers, and decomposers there. Yes? <clears throat> and these, and we've talked about different biomes, different types of land, like, like we're, in, we're in a temperate zone, right? So is Northern, uh, um, so is Northern California and Washington, D.C. and Puget Sound. And what's the biome in Africa? Northern Africa, it's what? What's the biome there? It's what? Desert, desert, desert biome, right? So these, these, these geographical regions have similar pattern, light, uh, biomes and similar organisms living in these areas. Is that right? Okay, let's answer this question first. Read it over. Think about it first. Read it to yourself. So I know we think of geographers looking at land, but when they talk about ecosystems, you know, this is this interaction between things that are living and non-living, right? That's referring to the land, right? There is an interdependent relationship between living and non-living things within an ecosystem, yes? What's the answer here? So when we're talking about ecosystems from a geographer's perspective, we're looking at that in interdependent relationship between the organisms, the uh, producers, consumers, and decomposers, and the environment or the land. Thumbs up. So when we're thinking about geographers talk about ecosystems, we're looking at that inter- Inter, that interdependent relationship between living and non-living things on land. Thumbs up. Yay. Kind of a tough one. I, I know it's going to be, it's tougher than you think. How about this one right here? Another one. This one involves, um, I guess we're, this one involves land and we're going to do land. We're going to do one involving land biomes. Okay. So real quick. We got a land here. This so letters A, B, and C are land. What is the biome here? What is the what is the land? What is the topographical feature in each of these sections? It's all what? Northern Africa is what? Tropical rainforest? It's a desert. Saudi Arabia, desert. Um, Australia, desert. Who agrees? Yes? And and then we're also going to do one on water. So we got ABC referred to land, land features, topographical features within a biome. And we're going to do water. So let's start with water here. Um, water like um, two is what? That's called the what? The Red Sea. What's one? The Bay of Bengal. It's in the, uh, uh, the Balkan Sea. Uh, this one right here is a bay. It's south of India. It's the Bay of Bengal. And this ocean here, the, the, this sea here is the, it's south of China, South China Sea. 
Okay, let's answer these two questions. Ready? Are you ready? Read the first question. Go. That's a question on maps. And it's dealing with land or, or let's write down topographical feature. Tier three word. It has to do with the what is the land feature? What is the characteristic of that land? What is the feature of Northern Africa, Saudi Arabia, and um, most of uh, the outback? It's all, is it mountainous, plains, plateau? What is the answer? They all share what? Desert. Thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up. Okay, now let's do another one. Same map. Read it over. Go. Now this is involving waterways. We almost did it. We came so close. But this is our last one for today. So we're, we did pretty good. Okay, I'm going to highlight bodies of water. What's this one right here? Two is what? Help me out. Two is re re referencing what? What is that? The Red Sea. And one is what? The Baltic Sea. And this is what? The Bay of who? The Bay of what? The Bay of Bengal. And this one right here is the South China Sea. And what would this one here be? What would that be? If we added in an E here, what would that be? What's this one? If we added in that, I'm sorry, if we added in not a, 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 a that would be a five. This is the what? Mediterranean, right? Good to know. Good one to know. Okay, who can remember that this one right here is the Red Sea? The Red Sea. Thumbs up. If you can remember that, then what's the only one that's right? Then this one's right. If you can just remember one of them, the Red Sea, then you should be able to get the right answer. Or you know what? If you knew that this was the South China Sea, then you also would be able to get the right answer. Or if, if all you knew was this was the Baltic Ocean, you knew that was the Baltic Sea, then this would be the only one that's right. Who sees that, right? And you know what? If you all you knew was that three was the Bay of Bengal, then that could, so really all you need to know is one of these to get the right answer. Who sees that, right?